Hello, I'm Jason Dyer, and I will be chairing this session, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Apocalypse. We're going to be examining the effect of apocalyptic fear and excitement on societies and popular culture, and how societies have responded to the idea of mass destruction. The first of our speakers is Joshua Porter, who recently completed his Master of Arts degree in History at the University of Albany. He will be presenting his paper, Samantha Smith, Citizen Diplomacy in the Cold War. On November 28th, 1982, a 10-year-old girl from Manchester, Maine, mailed out a handwritten note to Yuri Andropov, the General Secretary of the Communist Party. Dear Mr. Andropov, my name is Samantha Smith. I am 10 years old. Congratulations on your new job. I've been worrying about Russia and the United States getting into a nuclear war. Are you going to vote to have a war or not? I'd like to know why you want to conquer the world, or at least our country. God made the world for us to share and take care of, not to fight over or have one group of people own it all. Please let's do what he wanted and have everyone be happy too. Sincerely, Samantha Smith. P.S. Please write back. Days turned into weeks, weeks into months, without a response from the Soviet leader, even though Samantha Smith had asked him very politely to write her back. Finally, Yuri Andropov wrote back on April 19th, 1983. In his response, he lauded Samantha for her letter, saying that she was a courageous and honest girl, resembling Becky, the friend of Tom Sawyer in her famous book of your compatriot Mark Twain. He answered her questions regarding the fear she had regarding nuclear war by saying that there are nuclear weapons, terrible weapons that can kill millions of people in an instant, but we do not want them to be ever used. Ultimately, Andropov concluded by inviting Samantha Smith and her family to come visit the Soviet Union and see that everyone is for peace and friendship among peoples. Samantha Smith then traveled to the Soviet Union in 1983, visiting Artek, a young pioneers camp in Crimea, and seeing the city of Moscow. Upon returning, she became an instant star, both in the United States, but also in the Soviet Union. The initial story is what got me interested in Samantha Smith, as it was told to me by my advisor at the State University of New York at Geneseo, a potential senior thesis for my undergraduate degree. Instead, unfortunately, I wrote about Nikita Khrushchev, the state of Iowa, and corn. Yet, the story stuck with me. Thankfully, during my graduate work at the University of Albany, I had the chance to once again revisit the story of Samantha Smith. The major thing that drew me to the story initially and was one of the focuses of my paper was fear. Fear that led a 10-year-old girl to write a letter to the leader of the Soviet Union and fear that led Yuri Andropov to write back. To understand the fear that Samantha Smith and Yuri Andropov felt means we have to have a brief history of the Cold War as a whole. One way to think about the Cold War is kind of placing it into like a three-act play. The first act taking place right after the Second World War and running up until around the Cuban Missile Crisis and after and the ascension of Leonid Brezhnev as General Secretary of the Soviet Union. The next act is kind of like an intermission or détente, which is a French word for relaxation, which this period signifies. There was a normalization of relations between the Soviet Union and the United States, including the SALT Treaty and the Kissinger years at the U.S. State Department. This period is around from 67 up until 1979, or the invasion of Afghanistan by the Soviet Union. The final act takes place following the end of the taunt and is punctuated by a few events that brought the United States and the Soviet Union close to an exchange of nuclear warheads. The latter half of that period is the slow collapse of the Soviet bloc and the return to normalization between the two superpowers under Gorbachev and Reagan. The problem is, is this narrative is not the whole truth. The invasion of Afghanistan did end detente, but it was the final nail in a coffin. All through the late 70s, there was a growing movement within the United States and think tanks, universities, and government that detente was a deal with the devil. That by easing relations, by pressing on the break in the terms of the arms race, the Soviets would overtake the United States in nuclear and conventional arms. The thinkers were typically labeled as neoconservatives who were initially war hawks, on the left, who moved to the conservative side of politics because of the dovish nature of the Democratic Party, especially towards the Soviet Union. Often binary in view of the international world, neoconservatives began to gain large prominence in the years leading up to the election of Ronald Reagan, especially after the Team B paper was leaked. To put it another way, by the time Reagan became president, peace had become a dirty word. In fact, one of the neoconservative thinkers, author of the Team B paper, member of Reagan's NSC, and historian Richard Pipe stated that any peace would lead to abject failure because it was simply not in the Soviet nature to settle for peace. 
Therefore, aggression and victory was the only solution to the Cold War for the United States. Peaceful coexistence could not happen as long as the Soviet Union still drew breath. With this history in mind, it is quite easy to see the relations between the Soviet Union and the United States had soured after Soviets invaded Afghanistan. Rising tensions and stronger rhetoric from both sides kept ramping up for the first couple years of the 80s, a downward spiral that led to a growing fear in the United States and most also in the Soviet Union that nuclear war was ever more possible. Apocalypse was back in vogue. What is important to realize is that this new Cold War was not born from facts, logic, or credible intelligence. Instead, it was based out of an ideological framework that put the United States as the good and the just, and the Soviet Union as the bad good versus evil, an evil empire versus democracy. This change in focus meant that the United States acted recklessly in its rhetoric, using the words, I just did. In that polarized world, Samantha Smith woke up afraid of nuclear war and the apocalypse, so afraid that she wrote a letter to Andropov, the leader of the Soviet Union and the so-called evil empire, to see where he stood, asking simply if she should still be afraid. I doubt the leader of the Soviet Union, the largest nation on earth, would describe himself as afraid, but Andropov definitely was uneasy with how relations were going with the United States. In the years before becoming General Secretary, Andropov was leader of the feared KGB. In this post, he established what he hoped would better predict if and when the United States may strike first against the Soviet Union because of the heightened tensions. He called it Operation Ryan. For example, one of the objectives of this operation was to monitor blood bank levels in the West in hopes that it would predict a first strike, part one part of a many faceted operation that the KGB undertook. Andropov was scared or at least worried about what he described as a miscalculation, that one side would see a certain circumstances or events as a prelude to war and strike out of fear. Ultimately, Andropov wanted a return to detente to prevent a miscalculation or outright war. In my paper, I point out that the invitation of Andropov to Smith to come to the Soviet Union was not a novel event, but rather part of Andropov's continuing attempts to re-normalize relations. In my paper, I point out that Smith was part of a larger cohort of citizen diplomats that traveled to the Soviet Union. All returned with the same experience that Andropov and the Soviet Union actually did want peace with the United States and wanted a return to normalcy. Samantha Smith's words about the Soviet Union and how they were just like us and they too just wanted peace fell on deaf ears back home. Smith was interviewed by Johnny Carson after a trip and he seemed more interested in what Smith packed for her trip than her message of peace. He chided her at one point by saying that obviously the Russians did not show her the bad parts of the Soviet Union. Others were far more brash calling her a puppet for the Soviets and alleging that she had become a pawn in the communist plan for world domination. In a way, they won. For Smith did not continue to advocate for peace and instead she became a child celebrity. She did interviews for the Democratic primary candidates for Disney and then became an actress in a sitcom. Tragically, in 1985, on her way back to Maine after filming, she died in a plane crash less than 20 miles from her home. Mikhail Gorbachev wrote about her death that everyone in the Soviet Union who has known Samantha Smith will forever remember the image of an American girl who, like millions of Soviet young men and women, dreamt about peace and friendship between the peoples of the United States and the Soviet Union. The White House did not provide a public statement on her death. Our second speaker, Kenneth Riley, is a recent MA student from the University of Western Ontario. He will be presenting his paper, More Powerful Than the Atomic Bomb, Dinosaur Extinction and Nuclear Warfare. First, there was light. Then, a mushroom cloud followed. Debris and soot spread throughout the atmosphere, blocking the sun and sending the earth into a cold, desolate winter for those few survivors. This was not the fate of people following nuclear winter, but of dinosaurs after the asteroid hit. By the 1980s, it grew increasingly difficult to tell apart the extinction of dinosaurs from nuclear Armageddon. Comparisons between the asteroid theorized to have wiped out dinosaurs with the possible annihilation of humans could be seen in newspapers, scientific journals, television, and literature. Even the 1987 funk single, Walk the Dinosaur, drew connections between the extinction of dinosaurs by an asteroid and the bomb. And I quote, A shadow from the sky, much too big to be a bird. A screaming, crashing noise, louder than I've ever heard. 
It looked like two big silver trees that somehow learned to soar. Suddenly a summer breeze and a mighty lion's roar. I killed the dinosaur, I killed the dinosaur, end of quote. Mass extinction captivated Americans after the long sleep of anti-nuclear activism in the 1970s. In the 1980s, following the 40th anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the decision of the Reagan administration to not seize production of nuclear weapons, there emerged newfound fears of nuclear annihilation, which occurred alongside newfound evidence surrounding mass extinction of dinosaurs via an asteroid. As a result, a new dinosaur was constructed for the Cold War. Media outlets, paleontologists, and physicists constructed this animal as a foil for Americans who felt that they faced a similar death from above. Evidence suggesting that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs made this species relatable for Americans who wondered if they faced a similar fate from a bomb. The dinosaur then became more than a relic. It became a warning of a possible fate for Americans. The asteroid theory of extinction emerged with the writings of Luis Walter Alvarez, who during, in his research discovered um, distributions of uh, metal irid iridium around the earth. Now, Alvarez theorized that this iridium came from an extraterrestrial source since iridium is usually found near the earth's core, leading him to hypothesize that an asteroid had hit the earth, causing the extinction of dinosaurs. Media outlets latched on to Alvarez's theory, giving dinosaur extinction an unprecedented amount of attention and drawing comparisons between the atomic bomb and the asteroid almost instantly. As one example out of several hundreds, a Chicago Tribune article in 1980 discussed an asteroid hitting the Earth with a force, quote, 10 billion times more powerful than the bombing of Hiroshima, end of quote. And the news article also contained a drawing of dinosaurs desperately trying to escape a, giant, a gigantic mushroom cloud. And, and there's a, an apocalyptic imagery throughout showcasing the final days of the dinosaurs. And other newspaper articles would discuss the asteroids being similar to a hydrogen bomb or to an atomic bomb or in dis and discussing the extinction of dinosaurs as mirroring what would happen if nuclear warfare was to emerge across the globe. And these extinction theories they also challenge notions of human, of human supremacy on the planet. When discussing extinction theories in a nuclear age, Ellen Goldman for the Boston Globe said that the asteroid theory challenged, quote, survival of the fittest. Our dinosaurs died together in a meteoric winter, a global catastrophe. As humans, we face a similar shared fate, end of quote. Goldman also discussed this topic for the Hartford Courant, writing that the asteroid theory challenged the, what she called the previous egocentricity of previous extinction theories that blamed the extinction of dinosaurs on, on their own stupidity. Um, and the article also had a drawing of a stegosaurus with missiles on its back instead of spikes and a humanoid face illustrating how fears of, a, of nuclear war influence understandings of the prehistoric period. Goldman also discussed how people interpreted dinosaurs throughout history and wondered if Americans had simply been given the dinosaurs, quote, the dinosaur story we deserve. And there was, a, and the extinction of dinosaurs became increasingly politicized in going into the 1980s, especially regarding the aftermath of the, of the alleged asteroid. Because Alvarez believed that when the asteroid hit the earth, it caused a distribution of sut and debris throughout the Earth's atmosphere, blocking the sun and causing a cool down of temperature, which meant that the survivors of the blast would soon freeze to death. And for physicists who are researching the impacts of nuclear warfare, they believe that a similar situation would emerge after you know, an all out nuclear war, which would cause the distribution of debris to block out the sun and create a nuclear winter. And so the paleontologists who believe that the asteroid theory was accurate, believe that their work was highly relevant for people who wanted to avoid a similar fate from nuclear warfare. Even uh, members of NASA who argued for projects that would shoot out bombs into any approaching asteroids, which write in their proposals how dinosaurs fail to learn the proper lessons in protecting themselves from extraterrestrial threats. And so humans have to arm themselves to protect themselves from extraterrestrial dangers. And newspaper articles would talk about these, um, the comparisons 
between the aftermath of the asteroid theory and nuclear warfare, discussing it as a quote-unquote prehistoric equivalent to nuclear winter, or even my favorite, an analog to nuclear winter. And paleontologists who expressed skepticism towards the asteroid theory claimed that they were often labeled as deniers of nuclear winter, labeled as uh, militarists, and also labeled as being ignorant of international affairs. And so the extinction idea was more than just a hypothesis about the past. It had this political present, which was the nuclear winter conjecture. And public interest in dinosaurs um, stayed strong towards the latter half of the 1980s and into the 1990s, and which was linked to um, broader issues surrounding the potential for destruction on this international scale. Um, studies conducted by Harvard University on what a thousand students from grade five to grade 12 thought about daily showed that nuclear war was their second biggest worry after their parents dying. This complicated the lives of educators who had to teach what they called a nuclear curriculum without generating intense dread, particularly around the subject of extinction. Teachers found that an effective way to teach students extinction without making them anxious was using dinosaurs. And even a children's book author, author Caroline Arnold, said that the extinction of dinosaurs was a, quote, fun way to teach students about nuclear weapons and the bomb. So in conclusion, suggesting that dinosaurs suffered a fate similar to atomic bombings not only communicated new theories in accessible terms, but also reimagined these animals. Their demise was no longer the result of them being dumb, slumbering brutes. Once rulers of the planet, complete annihilation from an asteroid more powerful than the atomic bomb changed that. In the wake of advancements of nuclear weapons, Americans perhaps faced a similar fate. These fears of nuclear annihilation created a new dinosaur in the popular American imagination, a mirror to humans. Its existence, and more importantly, its demise, provided lessons for those willing to project narratives of nuclear devastation onto this prehistoric period. While Americans in the Cold War so often imagined a future, they also looked back. And yet when they did, they could not help but also see their possible fate. Thank you. Our third speaker, Dr. Malcolm Craig, is a lecturer at Liverpool, John Moores University. He will be presenting his paper, The Nuclear 1979, Revolution, Islam, and the Bomb. So on Sunday, December 9th, 1979, the British Observer newspaper ran a lengthy article called How Dr. Khan Stole the Bomb for Islam. Who was Khan? Did he really steal the bomb for Islam? Well, first off, Khan was A.Q. Khan, Abdul Qadir Khan, a Pakistani metallurgist who in 1975 had stolen uranium enrichment centrifuge designs from his work at the El Melo enrichment plant in the Netherlands. He absconded back to Pakistan with these designs and they provided the kickstart for Pakistan's nuclear program. Now, did he steal the bomb for Islam? Well, this article was part of a tidal wave of media reporting on the so-called Islamic bomb. The Islamic bomb placed Pakistan's nuclear program not in a national context, but in an international context. It suggested that if Pakistan, a Muslim nation, gained the atomic bomb, it would axiomatically hand it over to other Muslim-majority nations purely because of the bonds of faith. Now, in order to explore this idea of the Islamic bomb and the so-called Muslim world dragging the rest of the globe to a nuclear apocalypse, we need to wind back a little bit. Now, the phrase the Islamic bomb had been used by Pakistani leaders, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, and after him, Muhammad Zia-ul-Haq, in 1977 and 1978, as a rhetorical device to try and establish leadership for Pakistan within the Muslim sphere. But by the time early 1979 rolls around, the Iranian revolution has been successful. And this provoked emerging Western concerns about new forms of Islamic radicalism. Now, hot on the heels of the Iranian revolution, there was the March 1979 expose of Khan's 1975 theft. This first appeared on the ZDF2 television channel in West Germany. It used the phrase, the Islamic bomb, to terrify its audiences, and this phrase was quickly picked up by the English language media. So the Islamic bomb entered common usage from March 1979 onwards. In the media, it was used to identify a dangerous nuclear development, 
the exchange of nuclear information and capability from one state to another because of the bonds of religion. It was popularized by a wide range of figures and institutions. Journalists and pundits like Jack Anderson, William Sapphire, and Walter Cronkite in the United States, the BBC, the Guardian and the Observer in the UK. It also appeared in films, novels, and TV programs. And throughout 1979, newspaper articles, editorials, investigative reports, and TV specials only increased their usage of the term. Now, like the use of the phrase weapons of mass destruction in the run-up to the 2003 invasion of Iraq, Islamic bomb as a term became accepted in the Anglophone media to the extent that its essential meaning is just accepted as common sense. It's important to note that that within government and intelligence circles in Washington and London, there was considerably more uh, doubt about the existence of a so-called intra-Islamic proliferation network than there was in the media. While there was indeed significant financial relationships between, for example, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, there was little, if any, evidence that Saudi aid was deliberately intended to fund a so-called Islamic bomb. But for the media, the most threatening link was between Pakistan and Libya. But in truth, by the time 1979 rolled around, the relationship between those two nations was on the wane and had considerably soured. The trope's popular repetition within a Middle Eastern context represented a deliberately reductionist take on Islam, the region, and nuclear proliferation. Now, in the same way as the scholar Edward Said identifies wider media approaches to Islam as largely negative and monolithic, presenting Islam as the defining factor behind national nuclear programs the Islamic bomb eliminated, and still does eliminate, political, philosophical, theological, and moral complications at a time of rising intra-Muslim division and geopolitical competition. And the Islamic bomb, as a trope, also argued for a difference between Islamic and other nuclear weapons, a difference where legitimate security concerns are diminished, but the desire to wage raw violence is magnified. Now, the Islamic bomb trope emerged from deep historical anxieties about Arabs, Mohammedans, mad dervishes, and challenges to Western authority emerging from the Middle East and North Africa, where religion and race were melded into an alarming paper tiger. Since at least the early 19th century, the dominant narratives in, for example, US thinking about Islam identified it as violent, despotic, barbaric, and intolerant. As Karina Walther demonstrates, Mainstream discourses on Islam were often narrow, simplistic, and frequently belligerent. And as the Cold War emerged and solidified, US policymakers' attitudes towards Islam as a force mutated from threat to bulwark against Arab nationalism to being subsumed by the very nationalism it was meant to contest. And the sense of threat inherent in the idea of the Islamic bomb also had political antecedents. Post-World War II pan-Arabism attempted to build an image of assertive Arab unity, a unity that often challenged the West and its interests. The 1956 Suez Crisis, the 1967-60 War, and the 1973 Yom Kippur War, and the oil crisis created real and perceptual changes in the relationship between the US, the UK, and the Middle East. And the trope also drew on the persistent conflation of Arab and Muslim. It constituted Islam as being particularly Middle Eastern, with Pakistan brought in through religion and its nuclear ambitions. Nowhere in Islamic bomb discussions were the East Asian Muslim majority countries such as Malaysia, Indonesia and Bangladesh or the significant Muslim populations of nations like India ever mentioned. And it reflected a wider conflation that emerged in the 1970s where Arab became synonymous with Muslim, Iranians with Arabs and the undifferentiated mass with violence and terrorism. So the Islamic bomb therefore merged long-standing fears, the existing prejudices of the nuclear age and the radical international power shifts of the 1970s. So why does this all matter? Well, it's the case that nuclear weapons have never really been trusted to non-white others. We'd include the Chinese bomb in this. It was a conspiracy theory, but like any conspiracy theory, it had a kernel of truth. Pakistan was seeking nuclear weapons. So was Libya's Colonel Gaddafi come to that. In 1970, few would have suggested that by the decade's end in 1979, the Islamic world would be in the throes of revolution and state-sponsored Islamization. By 1979, a fusion of anxieties about seemingly resurgent Islam, nuclear proliferation, and conspiracies real and imagined provoked the Islamic bomb tropes emergence. It surfaced at a time when the Arab terrorist and the Islamic revolutionary became increasingly prominent in the demonology of Western popular culture. In the West, 
The phrase echoed the clash of civilizations thinking that suffused official and public US thinking, for example, before, during, and after the Cold War. From its origins within the Indo-Pakistani rivalries in nuclear politics, it became mapped onto the atomic ambitions of any Middle Eastern state or non-state group. The Islamic bomb was therefore a pernicious filament connecting Western fears about Islam, worries about nuclear proliferation to uncontrollable others, and more general apocalyptic anxieties about nuclear war. Of course, Abdul Qadir Khan later went on to establish an international centrifuge proliferation network in the 1990s, but the motivations behind this were less to do with any kind of Islamic solidarity. After all, he sold centrifuge designs to North Korea, and more to do with money and power. And even up to today, the phrase is still used in reference to, for example, Iran's nuclear program, but it's also come full circle and is used as a positive endorsement by supporters of Pakistan's nuclear status. What emerged in 1979 is not going away anytime soon. Our final speaker, Corinne Wheeler, completed an MLIT in medieval history at the University of St. Andrews in 2018, following a BA in ancient and medieval history at Royal Holloway, University of London. She works as an archives assistant for Cambridgeshire and Huntingdonshire archives, where she is a specialist in transcribing and analyzing medieval and early modern records. She will be presenting The Great Peril of Their Bodies and Souls, Failure, Response, and History in the Würzburg Annals. By December 1148, the French and German armies of the Second Crusade were making their long journey home from the Levant. Conrad III of Germany wrote home, angry and grieved that the Crusaders had achieved nothing. By all accounts, it was a failure. The reactions in England, France, and Germany were ones of shocked sorrow. Bernard of Clairvaux, a key figure in the preaching of the crusade, questioned for whom is the failure not sad? Sadness, anger, and perplexity are all evident in the accounts of contemporary and near contemporary writers who tried desperately to explain the crusade's failure. There arose a further explanation in the 1160s in a small number of German writers, and by small I mean two. Gerhard of Reichsberg and the anonymous author of the Würzburg Annals both put forward eschatological and apocalyptic explanations of the event. In this paper, I will demonstrate how the writer of the Würzburg Annals interpreted this disaster with respect to the papacy and the apocalypse in the first part of the 1147 entry. The writer of the Würzburg Annals is highly critical of the crusade. And this statement by itself is quite unremarkable. Any military failure, even today, produces a level of criticism from contemporary and near contemporary writers, as well as historians, as they try to attempt to explain the failure. Most often, this is directed towards the participants. For example, William of Malmesbury put the defeat of the English at Hastings in 1066 down to their immoral lifestyle. Frankish campaigns in the Levant between 1099 and 1145 were not exempt from this criticism. Henry of Huntingdon blamed the failure of the first siege of Damascus in 1129 on the sins of the Latin settlers. The failure of the Second Crusade, a papally sanctioned endeavor, produced an explosion of literature all aimed at explaining the Crusade's failure. The Würzburg Annals was one of many sources which blamed the participants. It criticized the Crusaders themselves for hardly any could be found whose guiding intention was clearly holy and wholesome, criticizing the violence and the greed that motivated Crusaders. Bernard of Clairvaux, Otto of Friesing and Robert of Torigny are amongst other writers who also offered this reason. In addition to attacking the crusade as it unfolded, the Würzburg Annals diverges from other sources by challenging the legitimacy of the crusade from its very outset. The writer claims that on account of its sins, God allowed the Latin church to be a fligi, which can be translated as overthrown, damaged, ruined, or as I find most appropriate for this context, humbled. They go on to say that the crusade was preached by pseudo-prophets sons of Belial, witnesses of the Antichrist. The writer continues further, condemning the Lord Eugenius, pontiff of the Roman See. He is directly condemned for inciting all the kings of the Christian faith to go on crusade. As God's chief minister on earth, the writer implies that Eugenius should have been able to better guide the Christian kings, as well as the dukes, marquesses, bishops, archbishops, abbots, ministers, and the ordinary people that are also listed away from the danger instead of leading them straight into disaster. This accusation is aggravated by the biblical motif of Belial, which has many personifications and interpretations in religious texts. Its broadest interpretation, coming from the Bible, is the opposite of Christ. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians asks, what fellowship had 
righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, what concord hath Christ with Belial. The phrase children or sons of Belial is used throughout the Old Testament to describe unchristian humans, as opposed to anything supernatural, as Belial can sometimes be described as a demon. The image of Belial was popular with clerics in the early medieval period, including Pope Martin I and Bede, and continued to develop in meaning. So by the 12th century, Latin writers used Belial to, to mean a multitude of bad things, including those not pertaining to the Latin church, which included Jews, Muslims, and Christian heretics. It was also another name for the devil and for its absolute opposition to Christ, the Antichrist. By invoking this image, the writer of the Würzburg Annals escalates Eugenius's error by stating that not only were his actions wrong, they were done in direct opposition to the way of Christ and that he had guided Christendom on a distinctly unchristian venture. Elizabeth Seabury, in her work, Criticism of Crusading, suggests a slightly different interpretation of the Würzburg Annals, that God allowed the Latin church to be punished for its sins, to which the devil responded by inciting the Crusaders' rebellion. However, this interpretation is difficult to reconcile with the structure of the text. Firstly, no alternative punishment is suggested by the writer, which strongly suggests that the writer understood the crusade and its failure to be the punishment. Furthermore, the alternative reading would force us to take the line of the 1147 entry, God allowed the Western church on account of its sins to be humbled, as an abstract statement, which, considering that the 1147 entry is lengthy, doesn't quite fit the style of the writing. Instead, I believe that the whole passage is intended to be read together, which makes the bodged crusade the punishment. It is this rejection of the crusade that makes the Würzburg Annals so unique as a source. Other writers did not question the crusade itself or its calling. Why should they? Eugenius's bull calling the crusade, Quantum Prada Cassores, reassured those setting out of the godliness of their venture. When problems occurred, whether from the sins of the crusaders or the treachery of different groups from Greeks to Templars, it was firmly within the time frame of the crusade. By comparison, the Würzburg Annals states the crusade itself was wrong. This marks the first instance where crusading as an endeavor was challenged. The success of the first crusade, alongside a generation of Christians who'd been raised with the celebrated memory of its success, created an expectation that papally sanctioned crusades were destined to succeed in their goals. Such high expectations of crusading inevitably contributed to the heavy criticism of the Pope and this aspect of papal policy from the writer of the Würzburg Annals. Their method of explanation was much broader than that of other writers, so they questioned the legitimacy of crusading, rather than assuming the infallibility of the papacy, and consequently, that crusading was always a holy venture. The writer of the Würzburg Annals states that the goal of the crusade was to liberate Jerusalem. This is categorically untrue, mostly because Jerusalem was already Latin ruled, and the express goal of the Second Crusade was the retaking of the city of Edessa, which was lost in 1144. However, this goal is included in reference to the false prophets and sons of Belial. It was them who compelled all sorts of men to set out against the Saracens in order to liberate Jerusalem. The Bible predicts the establishment of the Antichrist in Jerusalem prior to the second coming of Christ, following a period of significant difficulty for Christians. I find it difficult to believe that the writer of the Würzburg Annals, who was almost definitely a cleric, would have made such an error, most basically because Jerusalem was still in Latin hands, and Latin pilgrims were still making the journey to a Christian city. Instead, I propose that the writer was implying that the sons of Belial intended to go to Jerusalem through the crusade to establish the Antichrist. Having been misled by false prophets and the Pope, crusaders tried to fulfill this, and luckily for them, it failed. The result of this is that it reminds the reader and the writer of their own place within the biblically foretold history of the world. It displays an awareness in the writer of that history and their observance of historical events which would lead to the ultimate catastrophe, the apocalypse. Times of difficulty often increase speculation on the apocalypse. Similar spikes can be seen during famines and plagues, most famously during the Black Death in the 1140s and 50s. Gerhard of Reichersberg also considered the Second Crusade through the view of world history, just with an accelerated timescale. He was convinced that the Antichrist would come in his lifetime, then ushering in the apocalypse. Although initially a supporter of the Second Crusade, he revised his opinions on its failure and published two treaties on the coming of the Antichrist, explaining how events in recent history fulfilled biblical prophecies describing events which would lead to the appearance of the Antichrist. In conclusion, the failure of the Second Crusade, a holy endeavor preached by the Pope and supported by clerics across Christendom, led the writer of the Würzburg Annals to challenge existing ideology on the legitimacy of crusading. Through this, they questioned the religious fallibility of the Pope and papal policies in a way that had not been done previously, i.e. through the medium of crusading, 
and which was not especially done so later. The mediocre to disastrous outcomes of later crusades can be attributed to the normal problems of military campaigns, the decreasing popularity of crusading, and the increasing precariousness of the Latin states through the 13th century, rather than any widespread issue arising from the legitimacy of the papacy's involvement in crusading. After all, the papacy continued to endorse and encourage military actions against enemies of the faith, even after crusading had passed out of fashion. The Würzburg Annals, whilst a radical text, shows no indication of being widely read or having had an impact on crusading ideology. Nevertheless, similarities between the Würzburg Annals and Gerho's writing demonstrate that there was an awareness of world history in 12th century Germany, in particular a concern that individuals held with their temporal relationship to the apocalypse. The next direction of my research is to explore the cultural influence of the Antichrist and the Apocalypse across 12th century Germany in the context of developing German crusading ideology from 1095 onwards. I intend to investigate whether these writers were a radical divergence from contemporary thought or whether they demonstrated the incorporation of contemporary disasters into the cultural appreciation and understanding of the apocalypse and cultural events such as crusades. All of you have spoken of societal fears. Fears can have both negative and positive effects. Is there anything uniquely negative or uniquely positive that came out of your research? That is, where some aspect of fear was highly specific to your research in its context. So I was kind of fascinated in my research. I, I initially started work on this during my uh, doctorate at the University of Edinburgh. And I was initially looking at kind of like race and nuclear proliferation, but eventually discovered that in the 1970s, these ideas about religion as a kind of cultural signifier of otherness became much more important within the context of Pakistan and the kind of greater Middle East kind of thing. And what struck me about this uh, is, and this I think, you know, ties back to the, the period that uh, Corn is looking at, the, the fear of this Islamic other was repeating tropes that had been around for a long, long time. It's very similar to the language that's used about uh, Islamic others, Saracens, whomever, in the 11th century, 12th century, 13th century onwards. So these fears about, about Islam and about Muslims, are, I found them both contemporary in the sense of the nuclear age, but really, really these, these deep-seated, long-standing fears within, kind of, I know it's an anachronism to talk about anything prior to the 20th century as Western, but within Western thinking. Definitely. Um, I mean, this source is really interesting because if you look at a lot of other crusading sources, especially the, I'd say especially sources around the first crusade, the amount of othering of Muslims is absolutely phenomenal, you know, to the point that they're just referred to, I can't remember which source in, but they're referred to as the hairy ones. And it's, it's just bonkers. But what's really interesting about this source is that there is a sort of latent fear of Islam, but much of it seems to manifest in how other Christians distance themselves from the writer or how they view that they have been distanced. Um, so I wouldn't say like fear is like the overriding tone of this piece. If you look at someone like Gerhard Reichersberg, who is absolutely convinced that the apocalypse is going to, or the Antichrist is going to come in his lifetime, it's written totally quite different. It's quite a fearful piece. Whereas this, there is a latent fear, but it's not the overriding emotion, which I think is really interesting from a crusading source, because it is, obviously, there are um, exceptions, you know, you talk about the Albigensian Crusade, about the Fourth Crusade, where they just go and sack Constantinople. But there is this view that there's a very, very direct kind of villain or group of villains in that it tends to be Muslims who are categorised as the others. And so it's really interesting in this source that it completely manifests differently and the others turn into just largely other Christians. They're um, Christian heretics or they're Greeks or they're Templars. I think it's interesting too that like it almost seems like there's like a prelude to the fear that then manifests which is the the othering of this like there is like a prelude before the Islamic bottom of like um othering Muslims othering Islam and then also in the Soviet when in the 70s like the neoconservative movement took and other the Soviet Union that it was a good versus evil thing like they're the evil empire which was given 
during and around Samantha Smith's visit to the Soviet Union, that speech was given by Ronald Reagan. Like there's that othering to justify the fear and to also perpetuate the fear. Like it keeps, it's like a swar- like a snowball effect of, okay, they're the, the other, they, so we should be scared of them. So they're the other. So it's more like it keeps building and building and building until you get to a point where like apocalypse is on the table, if you will. I was um, think, thinking with the with dinosaurs, the dinosaurs, they, they represent a fear of humans, pla- of the, uh, the place of humans being on the planet being a very fragile position. The idea of humans who are at the top of the food chain um, b- being potentially wiped out by an extraterrestrial threat, whether that's an asteroid or, or even a missile. And, and, the, and the extinction of dinosaurs, it suggests like both of that position is a fragile one, but that also that the world has experienced extinctions, well, and apocalypses, if, if that's the proper plural form, form for apocalypse, but if that's the, uh, has experienced multiple ty- different types of apocalypses throughout its history, you know, not only with the apocalypse of the dinosaurs, but, you know, you're looking at, you know, for example, like colonization of North America, the colonization of North America resulted in, in a, an apocalypse for indigenous populations, and or even in Walter Alvarez, who wrote this our groundbreaking article on the asteroid theory, he worked on the Manhattan Project himself, and he witnessed, and he actually got to observe the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki as well. And so he got to see a, like a, a, an apocal- a near apocalyptic event for people, for people that were living in Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. And so I think, yeah, the dinosaur theory, it goes into fears about both about human, you know, the fragile place that humans occupy. And it also speaks to this idea that the world has experienced the apocalypse again and again. And it also gets, in, it also gets into questions about who, experience, who has experienced the apocalypse, who hasn't. Yeah, I think that, that's really interesting. The point that you brought up about having um, different apocalypse or having different extinctions. Um, it's really interesting to look at when you're looking at modern sources because obviously you have that background um, and it's just made me think about um, the difference that looking at uh, medieval sources is you're following a biblically written history of the world there is one apocalypse there is one mass extinction and it's just kind of I think we have a or in the sort of modern world well anything post 13th century is modern but in the modern modern world um there's this idea that i don't know especially in the current climate where we have climate change and we are seeing lots of species go extinct and it's making a lot of scientists making a lot of historians and sociologists look at the human place in that looking at that from a a medieval context it's like interesting because you don't have that background of previous extinctions. There's nothing else to draw upon. And instead, the way they look at it, rather than looking backwards, is you look forwards, is you look at the Bible and you say, okay, what signs do I need to look out for because this is what's been written, rather than what signs could we look out for because that's happened in the past or we're going to have to go into this blind. Um, And I just thought that that was a really interesting um, point. I hadn't thought that before. Thank you. And that's a kind of, you know, a fascinating kind of, thing about when you know the comparisons between you know the the 11th century and you know uh in you know, 19, the 1970s and into the 1980s is kind of you have this you know, rise in the 70s in the united states of this you know christian zionist millenarian apocalypticism that that fuses together all this these biblical ideas with the you know, modern nuclear weapons and that, you know, the Armageddon is going to take place and it's going to be a nuclear war. And for some of them, you know, that's a, that's a joyous thing. It's going to lead to the rapture, you know, but it could get brought about with Muslim, by Muslims. And that's a much more problematic uh, thing to have take place. I think that's important, like, because I'm just thinking about that, because like the evil empire speech by Ronald Reagan was given at a church, like it and throughout the speech, except for that excerpt, there's a lot of biblical text in that speech. Like there's just quotes and quotes from uh, the Bible that Reagan gives, obviously because he's at a church, but also because that's where 
in a way, the United States was. They voted for Reagan in overwhelming numbers. Like they wanted a return to like moral. Uh, there's a moral piece to it, and in the Cold War, that's important. I feel like also just because like you have that uh, coming back up, and it's interesting that like they're using biblical verses to justify the apocalypse in both, like in the. Uh, second crusade all the way up through and also when talking about islam and the islamic bomb and also about dinosaurs like like it's all connected and it's interesting how that just is like a single thread that cut next all these papers together so with the with dinosaur extinction it was also, it's also really interesting how again events like like development of nuclear warfare also kind of in my at least in my research it seemed like changed how people changed the narratives that people created about the earth. And um, so there was, again, so the creating this, again, again, about that idea of the world having experienced the apocalypse again and again, um, this, the, this narrative of a world that's ex- that has experienced, that has been shaped by catastrophic events. Um, well, let me uh, actually, uh, uh, can, can I direct my next question directly to you and then bounce it from there? Sure. Um, do you see in what, what you, you were researching, um, what the role of misunderstanding and confusion, um, if there's any role in that played into that, that they're just not understanding and that somehow balloons into uh, fears or, or excitement that really shouldn't be there? Yeah, yeah, there was, because um, the asteroid theory itself, among paleontologists, it was highly debated. Uh, because there was some paleontologists believed that the extinction of dinosaurs didn't quite line up with the time when the asteroid hit the Earth, leading some paleontologists to hypothesize that perhaps its impact was overstated. And but I think like media outlets um, found the idea of of dinosaurs dying suddenly from a catastrophic event you know, quite quite easy to sensationalize as well. And so and. And, the, and you see them and the image and the imagery of dinosaurs as, you know, trying to run away from mushroom clouds in, you know, fire, fire in the sky coming down on dinosaurs and killing them. It was the imagery, the imagery was, was dramatic as well. And it was proved, e- proved easy to sensationalize. And I do, th- and there was the Carnegie Natural Museum. They, in the 1980s, they conducted a survey, um, collecting the various questions that people asked about dinosaurs and the majority of the visitors asked how dinosaurs went extinct and the Carnegie Museum they believed that it was because of media coverage um, that kind of that made people interested in learn in learning about how dinosaurs went extinct. Well I mean there's a persistent uh I mean, I think certainly what comes out of my research, and I think this is this is, is true today, is it is in the period I'm looking at, the 1970s and 1980s, there, there is a persistent misunderstanding of of Islam. I mean, the, the, the Islamic bomb represent you know it represents Islam as as monolithic, as undifferentiated. That if you're a Muslim anywhere in the Greater Middle East, and by that I mean basically from Pakistan all the way through North Africa, uh, that you are somehow the same. It completely ignores the, the many, many varied and subtle differences within Islam, within uh, you know, regional and local and international and transnational uh, contexts. Many of these people commenting on the idea of Islamic bomb don't know the first thing about Islam. You know, they wouldn't know a, a hadith if it came up and kicked them. So, you know, there's, there's a deep uh, sense of, or there's a deep problem with kind of like, you know, misunderstanding the, both the religion and the part of the world. Because Middle East is a term that we use. We impart that upon this area. We call the Middle East. You know, I, I'm using it for convenience because we know what we're talking about. But what really is the Middle East? You know, where is it? It's, where is it middle from? Where is it east from? Well, it's east from us. You know, it's not, not east from anyone that lives there. So the persistent sense of mis- misunderstanding and you know, confusion about the places and the people and the religion and basically the very core of what is being discussed when you're talking about something like the Islamic bomb. I think it's, I mean, miscalculation and misunderstanding is like at the heart of why the third part of the Cold War actually happens after or the end of the taunt. Like miscalculation, I mentioned slightly about the Team B paper, which was a paper that grossly like exaggerated the possibility of Soviet nuclear and conventional arms like that was the 
it was almost the point that it was supposed to be exaggerated. Like they called in experts outside of the CIA to do a paper on the Soviet uh, capabilities. And they drew from like the who's who of neoconservative thought to do the paper and to do this paper that then is leaked to the public and to the media that then kind of creates this like general unease in the American public that the Soviets are actually winning the Cold War when at the time probably it's farthest from the truth like at this time it's the era of stagnation in the Soviet Union it's a period of general malaise and that doesn't seem to actually matter like it's it doesn't matter anymore because the politicization of it has taken over the actual like narrative like it doesn't matter that it's untrue it just matters that they're evil and we're the good guys and we have to defeat the evil like that's basically what happens and if you're in that view in that framework you don't really think that there's any other option if not apocalypse if we can somehow do win a nuclear war against the soviet union that's on the table if we can do it because they're evil like there's no other solution to that other than the collapse of the soviet union which nobody saw coming in the 70s so it was either that or war and i don't know where the exit ramp was for these thinkers in that sense i found it interesting you just saying about the the kind of absoluteness of the two positions of one's one is good and one is evil it's interesting because in the second crusade even though it it produced so much literature and so much talking about why it went wrong, how it went wrong. There wasn't, or I don't recall at the moment, any source that is like, they, or this sort of disastrous, they're coming to get us, which you kind of get in um, 1187 when the city of Jerusalem falls to Saladin. Um, There is quite a lot of fear at that point that Saladin's armies are just gonna march straight, straight through. But there isn't that kind of fear at the Second Crusade, and it just made me think about um, that. And actually, kind of the fact that this source does take such a strong position in demarcating certain groups and certain people as they are helping the Antichrist. Essentially, they are almost their followers. Um, There's a slightly later part of the 1147 entry where they go into this in much more detail, and it's it's very extreme and they're talking about how or it's implied at least that some of the crusaders converted to islam but it's it's interesting that that point of view remains fairly um centered to this source it didn't ever become really wide, widespread in terms of they are complete evil and they are coming back at us if that makes sense uh, one thing that I, i've been trying to figure out from from listening to the different panelists today is that we actually cover quite a few regions of the world in, in all this. And um, uh, there's been a lot of emphasis on the differences. What is the common ground between modern America and modern Middle East and um, um, pre-modern Middle East? I mean, what, what is the, 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 is there any common ground between all these fears of apocalypse that kind of tie it together? Or are they too different to really compare that well? Too basic, but I think the thing that has come across is this idea that the apocalypse is definitely going to happen, which I know sounds really, really basic, but if you look at something, for example, like Catharism, um, there is much less prevalence on the apocalypse is going to happen. Although the way I like to think about it is that there is a, uh, the most common spread of views is sort of how we today look at climate change. So there are some people that are like, it's, we are, it is already too late. We are on the path. And there's some people who kind of deny that it's going to happen, but most people sort of sit fairly centrally on that spectrum and gradually heading towards uh, the end of, um, or away from complete denial. I know it sounds silly just to say that the apocalypse is going to happen, but to have an awareness of where you are in history and where you are in terms of the end of the world and the start of the world, I think it's something that combines all of them. Yeah, that, that's a, I, I think that's actually a really great point. I was also thinking about the role of expertise 
in questions around what if the apocalypse is going to happen um because like speak, speaking to my research there was people who, who believed that the asteroid theory had important lessons for the 1980s would often invoke you know the authority of paleontologists by saying look these scientists are saying that this is gonna this is gonna happen, and notice some parallels as well between climate change as well. When people who believe in climate change are attacked on the basis of their of their expertise, or or even like even like we see like in um in in Joshua's presentation as well, as thinking about like attacks on the person's age, assuming that they're naive and that they got they got spoon fed a particular version of events that made them think that it's that made them think it's a bigger deal that it is. So yeah, I was thinking about, I think in the, connecting all these papers is that, is that theme of expertise and also who's, who's saying that this extinction, that, this, that the apocalypse is happening and why, or wh- why, their advi- why their warnings are ignored or, or paid attention to. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really interesting point. I think, I mean, I think that does link things up really well is this, this notion of, of authority and, and expertise in kind of like, you know, propounding ideas about the apocalypse. Because, you know, it's when we think about kind of the, the Team B exercise, it was just, I mean, one of the key figures in that, you know, is Paul Nitzit, you know, like long-standing national security figure in the US. And he's one of the figures in 1949, early 1950, who's the prime author of the NSC 68 paper, which with the advent of the Korean War provokes Harry Truman to have this massive rearmament program. Uh, in the in the United States, and you know, there's a figure who, nearly 30 years later, is still considered authority. Apart from the you know the fact he got things wrong all the time, and that was I mean that's one of the things at Team B is they were wrong. I mean almost everything they said was was incorrect. But I mean certainly in my own research, you find that within government, there's a there's an immense and I primarily look at London and Washington. There's an immense amount of doubt about the Islamic bomb, most of the time intelligence agencies and diplomats and observers are going, oh, I don't think this is actually a thing. It's a propaganda problem, but it's not a thing. It's not happening. Pakistan isn't giving the bomb to Libya or to Saudi Arabia or to Saddam Hussein or to the the Ayatollahs in Tehran or whatever. But in the media, it's these important pundits, what I think Eric Alterman called the punditocracy, who like Jack Anderson and figures like that, and Martin Kondrake and all these other figures who are really kind of like using this phrase again and again. And they never really define it. Most of the time, that's the interesting thing. They rely on the, the common sensicality of it and their authority to drive home these ideas that the Muslims are developing the bomb, they're going to share it, and they're going to drag the world into an apocalypse. So yeah, ideas of authority and expertise, I think, whether it's, you know, chroniclers from the 11th, I'm probably using entirely the wrong term, Corn. sorry, I do apologize. Chroniclers from the 11th century, all the way up to pundits and national security experts during the late Cold War. It's this idea of expertise, learning, authority, all of these kind of things. I think that definitely is interesting because like, I, uh, I mean, in my presentation, I mentioned uh, the professor Richard Pipes, who was a professor at Harvard University. Like he's not just some like layman uh, professor, like he's, at Harvard and he remains at Harvard while NSC chair f- or on the NSC, not as chair, but on the NSC for the Reagan administration. And we have that going on and he's espousing these things that we can now prove are wrong and is still used in current historical debates is still recommended as a uh, expert on certain things when we know a lot of what he speaks about are from a very different lens than what we now understand after the Cold War has ended. And I think that's an interesting point that expertise is important, but it's also can be used politically in a way that is not justified for what it should be happening at the time. Yeah, definitely. Um- it's, it's really interesting hearing you three talk about um, experts because we don't know an awful lot about the Wurzberg analysts, so it really could just be the monk sat in his cell with nothing to do. <laughs> um, but I think that's what I find really interesting about this source is that it displays so much kind of knowledge, 
about the apocalypse and especially in its biblical context. You know, there is this uh, overriding idea that um, the medieval apocalypse was the realm of some very, very radical clerics. Um, and that actually it was e well, a mix of, you had to be quite a high station of quite a high level of education and a mix of you had to be slightly insane. Um, neither of which is really true. Um, and it's really important that this source demonstrates that because it, it's not a well known source. It's not a source that had huge influence really that I can identify anywhere. Um, but it's really interesting because it's one person's interpretation of something that has previously seen, been seen as being something that would have been beyond them unless they were in a certain group, but they're interacting with it almost independently. Um, so it's just interesting to put that from a modern context of sort of authority and expert into a medieval context of kind of what does that that mean because they have access to uh, education and they had access to enough discussion to be able to um, be able to implant um, biblical motifs into their work um, so it's a really interesting source to show kind of how widespread um, that level of education that level of biblical knowledge was. So one of the other common themes all the um, panelists talked is uh, storytelling, that we're looking at different ways that we remember things and pull up their stories, different things from religion that we pulled up their stories, things that we've just invented on the spot because of uh, how we're afraid or how we're trying to conceive the world. Is there anything particular to the tradition of storytelling that you feel is important to what you've been researching? Well, I'm not sure about kind of like you know, the, the tradition of storytelling, but I find it interesting the way that kind of like my kind of research into the, the so-called Islamic bomb, I always put so-called in front of it, uh, is the way it starts impacting the, the fictional stories we tell ourselves. So it starts appearing in novels uh, like The Fifth Horseman. Don't bother reading it, it's not very good. Uh, Films like the terrible Sean Connery vehicle from about 1982, Wrong is Right, don't watch it, it's a bad film. Uh, but it even pops up, and this is how I can spoil any film for anyone, uh, even pops up in Back to the Future. You know, how does Back to the Future start? Well, Doc Brown is gunned down by Libyans. He's meant to be getting nuclear material for. And in a way, kind of like Back to the Future kind of draws upon the prevailing ideas about about Islam, about radical regimes in North Africa, the Middle East, about nuclear weapons, all of, all of these kind of things. So it was, it was just interesting in studying this topic, you know, you know, seeing the ways in which these ideas start to trickle in to, to popular culture. That's kind of interesting because I'm just thinking like it's even in video games now, like the Islamic bomb is in like some of the newer Call of Duty games, like big blockbuster games that now that even now, even still, it's still a trope that it continues to go even now. And of course, the Russians are there too, giving the bomb away. Like it's, it's a very common thread and it's very interesting that that's still persisting 40 years after the first like big fear of it coming around. Well, I mean, that was one of the things, I mean, kind of in the 1990s, you know, with the breakup of the Soviet Union, there was a, you know, there was multiple newspaper stories and articles of, you know, does the Islamic bomb now exist because there are nuclear weapons stationed on independent Kazakh soil? You know, there was a, the, the, the idea about loose nukes, that there's going to be all these nuclear weapons floating around and that's going to generate the Islamic bomb and all of these kind of things. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's really, it's persistent. It's really persistent up to the present day. Um, I was thinking with, with mine as well as thinking about the role of dinosaurs as, as a symbol for know, almost any issue in American history. Cause you know, going back to world war one, there was a, a paper mache stegosaurus called Jingosaurus that was made to protest American involvement in World War I, saying that it was all armor and no brain, and suggesting that it would uh, be, by being offensive, being purely offensive, it would call, it would doom itself to extinction. Then, 19, then there's like cartoons in the 1960s, 1970s, suggesting that communalism of dinosaurs um, caused eggshells to soften, and, it, and, it, and, it, and, caused, and so dinosaurs couldn't hatch and they would go extinct because they couldn't cope with the individualistic work, capitalistic world. And then in 1980, 1980s, 
during um, the period I was looking at, I noticed that like a lot of um, science fiction stories um, emerged that would involve the threat of a comet hitting about to hit the earth. And also this idea of, and also like dinosaur toys as well becoming a lot more social Darwinistic. It's this idea, you'll often see a lot of artwork that showcases dinosaurs fighting each other. And it's, you know, this invoking like survival of the fittest. And so that causes this, um, this perception of, of dinosaurs reflecting, you know, a world, a world in, um, in constant conflict. And so I would say, yeah, the di- dinosaurs as a, as a narrative tool, they've definitely reflected the, um, reflected the period in which they were produced in. Yeah, I think what's interesting in my source is that we get the opportunity to kind of think about, well, why did the author write this and why did they expand it? Um, because although it is an annal, it, it is more, it's quite a bulky source if you're just saying an annal. If you just want to write an analytic history, you write something like Swabian Chronicles that is quite actually quite short. Um, Whereas what's really interesting in this is they've expanded it. It's not just a historical jotting down of events. Um, it's actually been expanded um, and imbued with all these dib- different biblical meanings. And I certainly think for part of this, in addition to explanation um, and explaining why these events happened, um, it, the story is quite heavily imbued with morals as well it's definitely uh some form of cautionary tale um i don't know if that crops up in um the sort of um the primary material that you guys use as well oh yeah yeah like i definitely saw the idea of of dinosaurs as a cautionary tale in mine as well Uh, again like you know nasa invoking you know members of nasa invoking the idea of dinosaurs being unable to protect themselves from the asteroids, so there's this idea. They, they in fact say, you know, dinosaurs failed to do this. We need to do better. And there was, and they would talk about, and they would say that, you know, that um, we people who are proponents of disarmament would say that we need to disarm ourselves because if we don't, if we don't, we're going to go down. We're going to face the same fate as dinosaurs. And so yeah, there's this, yeah. So yeah, there was definitely that idea of dinosaurs as a cautionary tale. Um, this one is just, I'm curious on an outside perspective, um, and this is partially speaking to the people watching this video right now who are worried about current events, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, historian's perspective is nice because you, you can see, uh, see at least to some extent um, what the results of things were. Are, are there any concrete things, like if somebody was cons- that was in that time period had concern about the apocalypse, if you were, were speaking to them directly, essentially, um, how would you address their concerns? Like, what, what would you say, like, this is a mistake that people made at this time directly, that, that, or this is a good thing that happened that helped? That, that, that's sort of um, what, what I'm kind of curious for the last question, if anyone has any thoughts about that for their research. For mine, it was Samantha Smith when she returned home from uh, the Soviet Union after her trip and seeing the Soviet Union going to Artek as like a member of the Young Pioneers and like staying with uh, uh, Soviet citizens, Soviet people, was she came back and the one thing she did say at the Carson uh, interview was, they're just like us. They're just, they're the same. They want peace as much as we do. And I think that was the major message that she tried to give back to the American public and the American media that wasn't ever understood. And I think that would be the thing I would tell people back then would be that to not other the other side, like to not make it a polarized world to because in doing so, it is allowing you to justify apocalypse, to justify war, to justify the fear that is coming. I mean, and she was dismissed. I think that's the big thing was she was just like, oh, no, you don't understand. You're just a young girl. You don't understand how the world works. You don't understand how the Soviets are actually like evil or devils or they just are atheists. They're, they, don't, you, they don't even have the same worldview we do. We can't even begin to uh, start. So I think that would be my first thing is to 
see people as people. I guess that's kind of a idealistic kind of a thing, definitely in the current climate we're in. Um, but I think that is what would be necessary in that situation. And I think that's what's necessary even now is to not other other people, like other other cultures, other other states, other other nations, or even people in your own country. I'm going to give the really fusty historian's answer in that 2020 hindsight is a wonderful thing. And history happened the way it happened because of circumstance and contingency and all these kind of things. And if you change one thing, who knows what else you might have changed. So saying do this, you know, oh, you should have done this. Well, you know, you don't know because people were protesting against nuclear weapons. People were concerned about the apocalypse. They, you know, they did take concrete action. You know, the, the women's peace camps at Greenham Common, for example, hugely long lasting, hugely important. People did take action. Uh, if you change that, what happens? Counterfact. I've got a real problem with counterfactuals. So, you know, so it's so it's hard to say. But though, I mean, the one thing I would I would suggest about the uh, in terms of the spread of nuclear weapons is that one thing that we can learn from looking back at the nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties is how extraordinarily difficult it is and would be to prevent a nation from gaining nuclear weapons should they determinedly want them. Pakistan was not stopped despite the best efforts of the US and UK in the 1970s. Uh, short of military action, there was little that could have, could have been done. So in that case, we have to think about, well, what do we do? You know, accepting North Korea's nuclear status, for example, as a given. So you know, that's a useful thing to kind of look at in the past and say, well, should this dictate our actions in the future? I think a really interesting um, point is also to think about what constitutes an apocalypse. So the perspective I'm looking at it from is it's very much, a, or for this paper at least, is it's a very much a biblical apocalypse, um, which we can look at from the perspective of um, sort of Western Europe. I mean, I am, at, you know, I'm very firmly centred as a medievalist and I um, work largely with European texts and um, bits and pieces that happen around the Mediterranean. Um, but I would be really interested to see how um, societies and cultures went through sort of apocalyptic changes. So I'm largely thinking of sort of indigenous populations, um, definitely, you know, the spread of Europeans um, as well as slavery, how that impacted, because I'm not sure what you'd say to that. Um, Because it's very easy to say to medieval people um, living in Western Europe, unless you're living in the 14th century, the apocalypse it'll be fine, you'll be fine. Whereas I don't know if you can say that to um, other communities, other societies, where actually 95% of your population is decimated. That, you know, it's not the end of the world in a sort of biblical sense or a nuclear sense that it produces a nuclear winter or um, any of the other horrible side effects, but it is the end of that world. It's the end of your world. And I think that's a position that um, our, our sort of papers kind of struggle to comment on. So yeah, so definitely that's an area to explore as well. I think just to chime in there, because I think that's also important with my uh, research was there's an apocalypse like the nuclear apocalypse, but the Soviets also feared very much the apocalypse of the ending of communism in their state, but also outside their state. Like you read any papers uh, like Andropov wrote, writes a lot about also the fear of Marxist Leninism dying or, and that's also an apocalypse that is throughout Marxist thought is the idea that counter-revolutionary will try to bring down communism once it's established, that it begins to build and they see the world as us versus them because of that fear of the end of their ideology. And I think that play, and I mean, obviously the Nazi invasion in World War II definitely exemplifies and exasperates that fear that plagues the Soviet Union since its founding. And that's also a fear of apocalypse that is not nuclear and definitely not just because the Russian state would still exist. It just wouldn't be the ideology that would be, that then is dead. I guess... The big big takeaway from mine is that like is that you know, science science itself is never 
it's never new ne- it's never neutral never like it's never solely objective it's it's a, it's a result it's it reflects its political social and cultural circumstances in which it was produced in and and you know these extinction and therefore these these um these theories of the extinction of dinosaurs um were informed by that political present of nuclear winter and nuclear annihilation. Um, and so these discussions, as a result, these discussions around dinosaurs were never, were never going to be just about dinosaurs. And, and I think, and I could see, I, could, I see parallels um, between discussions around climate change and that, and just how, dis- how, you know, the sci- scientists reports on climate change, on the impacts of, of you know corporations on the environment and that like it, they're never just science they're heavily politic they're heavily politicized heavily influenced by by politics culture capitalism etc so yeah so yeah in short po- you know sci- even scientific theories of the apocalypse reflect a political cultural and social circumstance and that's a wrap we're going to go into final discussion now so uh, last points anyone wants to make, we're going to go in the same order that you presented your papers. We're going to start with Joshua Porter, so you can go ahead. In a Washington Post piece after Samantha Smith's death, Alan Goodman in 1985 said, so we ask children to express the fears that we share and the idealism that is finally our hope. There's something sad about the search for a child to lead us. It is kind of an abdication of power. I actually posted this to social media with no context, of course. And the response I got was to stop shilling for Greta Thunberg. I think the major takeaway is we still use girls and young women to express our fears. We still abdicate power to them. That is also one of the main reasons I find Samantha Smith so interesting as a topic. The same fears are still present, shifting to a new apocalypse, one with a new child that had to speak out against adults. And often we forget about their pleas and toss them aside when they become too inconvenient. I actually recently traveled to Maine and went to the Maine State Museum in Augusta. There is a small six foot statue of Samantha Smith that has a bear at her feet and a dove in her hands. It is the only statue or remembrance in the United States for Samantha and it was located beside a parking lot. It bothers me even now that we celebrate those who bring us closer to the apocalypse and place those who tried to prevent it at the periphery, literally. Dinosaurs as a cautionary tale continues even to this day. Some media reports on dinosaur extinction will say that dinosaurs died via global warming or climate change, and that therefore people need, and that humans therefore need to take steps to avoid the same fate of dinosaurs. Now, so this is not to say that global warming and climate change aren't real, but rather to suggest this narrative of a world shaped by multiple ends of the world it continues to inform our present day understanding, not only what came before, but what awaits us as a species. Thank you. So first off, I'd like to thank uh, my fellow panelists for a really vigorous and engaging discussion, some, some great uh, panel papers and commentary uh, there. It's been really a pleasure to be involved in this kind of fantastic public history effort. I think if these you know, tell us anything, all of these papers, that we need to be aware of how fears and concerns and anxieties about you know, the impending apocalypse or doom or any kind of threat are promulgated and uh, promoted around the world. I have a, a, a Google alert set up for the phrase Islamic bomb and every day uh, stuff pings into my inbox. Uh, so the phrase is still out there, it's still used and the concerns that were expressed about impending apocalypses whether it's the dinosaurs being wiped out 65 million years ago, whether it's the failure of the Second Crusade and the fear of an apocalypse uh, stemming from that, or the Cold War or the Islamic bomb. All these ideas that we've discussed are still with us today, as as my other panelists have far more coherently pointed out. Uh, So I'm really looking forward to having the opportunity to discuss this, perhaps in more detail, uh, after the panel is posted and when we have a chance to kind of... uh, uh, discuss these on the Ask Historians subreddit. It's very easy to look at the medieval apocalypse and people's reactions and think, oh, aren't they daft? They thought the world was going to end. 
And this belief is still present in a way that some historians approach the medieval view of the apocalypse as something radical and sometimes ridiculous. Furthermore, there's also the assumption that medieval people interacted with the apocalypse in the same way that we do. However, those Christians living in medieval Europe, the apocalypse was an intrinsic part of their faith, a key part of biblical chronology and the narrative of the Bible, and consequently part of their understanding of world history. It was part of everyone's religious experience, as demonstrated by the variety of work that it produced. The Würzburg Annals was a small piece of literature, but the idea of the end of the world inspired Hildegard von Bingen's Scivias. It inspired Ava's poems. It inspired wall paintings at Coventry and Westminster, amongst thousands of others across Christendom, as well as the Portico della Gloria in the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. The Würzburg Annals is one individual's interpretation of a theme which was continually present, which they interpreted through their present, i.e. the Second Crusade. Like Gerhard of Reichersberg, it is not the demonstration of everyone's view, but indicative of the fluctuating relationship that people held with the end of the world. I want to thank again all the panelists today for how I learned to stop worrying and love the apocalypse. Joshua Porter, Kenneth Riley, Dr. Malcolm Kigg, and Corin Wheeler. Thank you for watching. And don't forget, there's a Reddit Q&A thread where all the panelists will be there to answer your question. Also, this panel is one of many for this conference, so please see as many as you can. The next one coming up tomorrow is Pick Your Poison, Climate, Disease, and Human Disaster from the Middle Ages to Today. Thank you.